continue the Christological uh, part of our discussion here. And uh, uh, you guys, i got to get back on the camera for some reason. Let me see, where's my little... There it is. Okay, now, why did that happen? Okay. Okay, that's good. <coughs> now, let's see. Now, I've lost you guys for some reason. We're still here, Dan. You are? Uh, Jack, you need to push camera one or something like that so I can get you guys back. Jack's the man. He knows. Jack be a man with these years. Yeah, Jack's the only one break. Okay, other camera, Jack. Whatever number you push this. Yeah, there you go. Very good. All right, now. Camera two. Perfect. All right. Uh, we're going to continue the uh, Christological part of the discussion. We're going to pick up with a little yes. We don't see you now. You don't see me. No, we're seeing ourselves. Camera two. Does that change anything? No. <laughs> anything? Okay. Yeah. No. It's the same thing. Well, that is weird. Let me sit here. Okay, now I don't know what we're doing right there. Why is it doing this way to me? Still that way, huh? Let's see if it'll let's see if it'll voice activate. You guys talk loud and let, and let me see what happens. Jack doesn't have a driver's license. Okay. Thanks to the Lord for He is good. <laughs> okay. Everyone. And the whole congregation would reply. And his loving kindness to <laughs> Hey, at least you know we paid attention, though, Dan. Uh huh, you did. I, I mean, thought, I thought that was a good lectureship. It's just simply not getting to us, is it? Let me hit the near camera again and see if that helps get it from far to near camera. Camera two. <laughs> All right. Does that make any difference? No. Huh? No. Still not, huh? Same thing. Does that help anything? No difference. Now that is just weird. Okay, well, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to depend on... Uh, yeah, it is for us, but not for them. What I'm going to do is just depend on the audio in my computer. As long as you can see my computer, I can see you, so we're good. Okay, let's go. We're talking about the uh, some of the titles of Christ, and we were talking about the firstborn, the title firstborn. Colossians 1.15 says he's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. We were talking about how the, the word firstborn means preeminent or highest. And uh, we we're talking about uh, how we prove that from the Old Testament. Uh, if you look in, uh, this is the word prototokos, and we wrote this down earlier in our notes. Prototokos. Protos means first. Tokos technically is born, but it came to refer to the position of the firstborn instead of the idea that he was actually the first one born. 
uh, in Psalm 89:27, and we looked at this earlier in our notes, God says about David, King David, I will make him my firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. And of course, David wasn't even the firstborn in his family, but God is saying, I'm going to make him the highest of the kings of the earth. He's not using it in the literal sense of firstborn. In Colossians 1.18, uh, this same uh, term is used about Jesus. It says he's the beginning, the firstborn among the dead. And of course, Jesus wasn't even the first one raised from the dead because Lazarus was raised from the dead. The son of the Shunammite woman was raised from the dead. You know, so he wasn't the first one raised from the dead, but he's the first born among the dead because he's the ruler over the dead. It says here in the verse that in everything he might have the supremacy. So the idea of the firstborn one is the one who has supremacy over all others. And uh, this business of being uh, the firstborn, the supreme, the preeminent one, goes along with the idea that Jesus is sovereign and ruler, king of kings, lord of lords. And uh, this is what Timothy confessed about him. And uh, we talked a little bit more about uh, the uh, Son of God and, and the Lord and how those two were the same, uh, meaning that Jesus was going to rule your life. And he was actually declared to be the Son of God at the resurrection of the dead. This is stuff we've gone over before. We're not going to go back over it right now. All right, I want to go on down to something else here a little bit. I want to look for a few minutes at just the titles of Jesus that are in the Gospel of John. Now, you guys already had Gospel of John, right? Yes, sir. All right, and, and so we don't need to go back over all of these, but every one of these are titles and names of Christ that are in the Gospel of John. And he's the light of the world, John 8, 12. You know, I'm the light of the world. If anyone uh, follows me, he will not walk in the darkness, but have the light of life. Uh, John 1, verse 9, he was the true light that lighteth every man coming into the world. Um, there's so many passages about the light. He's the bread of life, John 8, John 6, 35. I am the bread of life. He who keeps coming to me will never hunger. He who keeps believing on me will never thirst. Uh, he's the true vine in John 15. And the only way the branches can bear fruit is to remain in the vine. He's the source of life, source of fruit bearing. He's the Lamb of God. And we're going to talk about that one in a little more detail in just a minute. Uh, This person keeps calling. Okay, he's the Lamb of God. He is uh, the Logos. We talked about that, the eternal word. By the way, in not only John, but what's another scripture for that, Brandon Morgan? The Logos. Watson? <laughs> Brandon Watson, sorry. Um, outside of John, you said? Yeah, outside of John. Hebrews 4.12? Yes, sir. Hebrews 4.12. And then uh, you have the Good Shepherd, which is John chapter 10. Now, the shepherd has a background, of course, just in the idea of shepherds, but the shepherds of Israel were the leaders of Israel. You could put Ezekiel 34 down as part of the background of that. But in, in John's Gospel, Jesus is the shepherd of the sheep, the one that that uh, calls them out, knows them by name, he leads them out, they follow him. He's the good shepherd. He's the door of the sheepfold, also in John 10. And you go in to safety and out to pasture through the door. So he's the door. He's the resurrection and the life, John 11. And in 1 John 1, verse 2, he is the eternal life, he's called. Of course, in John, uh, what is it, 14, 6, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. So he's the eternal life. These are all different things that you could say about Jesus. 
different aspects of the functions of Jesus. All of these have to do with uh, John's Gospel, and we spent so much time developing each of those in John's Gospel. We're not going to spend the time doing that right now. Let's look for just a minute, a little more detail about this one, the Lamb of God. Uh, <clears throat> now, the Lamb of God is is a sacrificial lamb, and primarily the lamb of God probably has to do with uh, the Passover lamb. If you go back to Exodus chapter 12 in the Old Testament, <clears throat> this is where uh, the Passover was sacrificed and uh, the people were given their instructions. You go to Exodus chapter 12, verse 3. Let's tell the whole community of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. If any household is too small for a whole lamb, they must share one with their nearest neighbor. And uh, verse 5, the animals you choose must be year-old males without blemish, without defect. You may take them from the sheep or the goats. Notice that a lamb here could be either a sheep lamb or a goat lamb. The word lamb refers to either one. And uh, verse 6, take care of them until the 14th day of the month when all the people of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. Then they are to take some of the blood. See, that's the blood of the lamb. And they're to put it on the sides and tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lamb. And, of course, the blood of the lamb on the house was what kept the death angel from striking that house. Because if you go down to verse 13, the blood, that is, the blood of the lamb, will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. See, he's killing the firstborn in every house in Egypt. But he says, when I see the blood, the blood of the Lamb, I will pass over you. So the punishment of God did not come to rest on those that had the blood of the Lamb on their <coughs> houses. <coughs> so that's why it's called the Passover feast, because the death angel passed over the houses where he saw the blood of the Lamb. They were rescued by the blood of the Lamb. Now, you can preach about that <clears throat> and preach about Christ, see? Because the blood of the Lamb is the secret to all that. But now, there's also probably <clears throat> some reference. If you look at Leviticus chapter 10, or 16, excuse me, Leviticus chapter 16. <clears throat> Leviticus chapter 16. <clears throat> And here you have uh, the goats that are sacrificed, the animals that are sacrificed. Uh, and I, I thought there was a mention of a lamb somewhere in here too, but there may not be. There were other sacrificial lambs that were sacrificed as sin offerings from time to time, but the primary lamb that seems to be in view with Jesus is the Passover lamb. Uh, <clears throat> I'll have to look at that a little bit more. Is it verse 15 and 16? What does it say there, to read? Then he shall slaughter the goat of the sin offering, which is for the poor people, and bring its blood inside the veil. Do yeah. Now that that may be you know that may be in view because we, the lamb could be either a goat or a lamb. Uh, that's possible, but uh, I was thinking of a more specific reference. But uh, anyway, let's go over to the New Testament here, and the New Testament references the most obvious one, John one twenty nine. And he says it more often than that in John 1, but he does say it in verse 29 where John the Baptist looks at Jesus and he says, Behold the what? The Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And so he's called the Lamb of God. But then the, the real uh, theological uh, power of this is that throughout the book of John, he keeps telling us that the Passover of the Jews is near. 
And then when you get to Passover time in John 19, Jesus is killed. But in John 19, verses 34 through 36, or 32 through 36, you have the real connection with the Lamb of God uh, theology. John 19. Because <clears throat> it says, beginning in verse 31, the Jews, therefore, since it was the preparation, and so that the bodies might not remain on the cross on the Sabbath day, for it was a high day, that Sabbath, they asked Pilate that uh, the legs of these men should be broken and they should be taken down. The soldiers therefore came and they broke the legs of the first and of the other that were crucified with them. When they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side and out came blood and water. <clears throat> now look at verse uh, 36. These things happened that the scripture might be fulfilled. A bone of him will not be broken. But that's Exodus 12, verse 46, which is talking about the Passover lamb. Exodus 12, verse 46. <coughs> Excuse me. Exodus 12, 46 is telling them that when they cook that Passover lamb, they're not to break any bones of it. But John says that that was fulfilled in the crucifixion of Jesus when his legs were not broken, <clears throat> which simply says that John recognizes that Jesus is the Passover lamb. He's the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. He's without blemish. That comes out in the Gospel of John when Pilate keeps saying, I find no cause for punishment in him. I don't find any charge against him. So... He's the sinless Lamb of God. But that's not all that John does with it in John's writings because we wouldn't be fair to him unless we went over to the book of Revelation. So we go over to the book of Revelation. And this is where he kind of uh, <clears throat> finishes out the idea of the Lamb. <clears throat> Uh, there's a there's a small reference to it that's kind of a cryptic reference to it in uh, the first chapter of Revelation. If you go to Revelation chapter 1, <clears throat> verse 5, not specifically called the Lamb, but we'll see how this ties in with the rest of it. Revelation 1, 5, And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth <clears throat> to the one who loved us and loosed us from our sins by his blood. Some translations say washed us from our sins by his blood. But if you compare this to the later references, it's talking about the blood of the lamb. I go over to chapter 5 of Revelation. <clears throat> Excuse me. Revelation chapter 5. <clears throat> and if you look down here in verse 6, excuse <clears throat> me, verse 4. And that's earlier than that. <clears throat> verse 6 says, The elders of the Lamb standing. Is that what you look for? Yeah, I'm looking back here. Yeah, verse verse 6. I saw in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the 24 elders, a lamb standing as though it had been slain. So here's a slain lamb. And it's it's the, the, the killed lamb, the sacrificed lamb. Uh <clears throat> But um, when you drop down to verse um, 9, this comes out again. They sing a new song saying, You are worthy, just talking to the Lamb, You are worthy to take the book and open its seals because you, the Lamb, were slain and did purchase unto God with your blood men of every tribe, tongue, people, and nation and have made them to be a kingdom and priest to our God. 
So the lamb was slain, and he purchased the people of God with his blood. See, the blood of the lamb. <coughs> and then if you look down in verse 12. <coughs> just a second. Now, I'm, I'm in a class teaching a class long distance to Denver, and so I'll have to talk to you later. Thank you. Okay. Um... In verse 12, he says, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain uh, to receive the power and the riches and the wisdom and the strength and the honor and the glory and the blessing. And again, notice the Lamb who was slain. You know, the blood of the Lamb, the Lamb who was slain. There's always a reference to the death of the Lamb, the blood of the Lamb. And uh, then if you turn over here to uh, Revelation 7... <clears throat> Revelation 7, he's looking at this multitude in heaven in Revelation 7. And if you look down here in verse 13, this, this multitude is, is uh, uh, well, even before you get to verse 13, go back up to verse 10. The multitude that's dressed in the white robes, they're crying out with a loud voice and saying, Salvation! Belongs to the one who sits upon the throne and to the Lamb. See, the Lamb is, is one responsible for our salvation. If you drop down to verse 13, one of the elders answering said to me, These who are dressed in the white robe, who are they? And where do they come from? And I said to him, My Lord, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones who have come out of the great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. See? So again, you start out in chapter 1, verse 5. He loved us and loosed us from our sins by His blood. And chapter 6, He's a slain Lamb. And He purchased unto God with His blood men of every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. And now here, they washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. <coughs> and then if you turn over here to... Uh, Let's see here. Chapter 14. <coughs> Excuse me. Chapter 14. Well, we don't need to go to 14 yet. We need to go to 12. Chapter 12, verse 11 of Revelation. I see it's talking about... Let's back up even to verse 10. <coughs> this is talking about when, when Christ was raised from the dead. I heard a great voice in heaven saying, Now has come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ, uh, because the accuser of our brothers, that Satan, has been cast down, uh, the one who accused them before our God day and night. Now, here we go. And they, that is our brothers, overcame him, that is Satan, through the blood of the Lamb. So how do you overcome Satan? Through the blood of the Lamb. The Lamb of God. So you can take away the sin of the world. So throughout the book of uh, Revelation, Jesus is pictured as the Lamb of God, the blood of whom uh, overcomes Satan, washes our robes, forgives our sins, uh, does all of these sorts of things. So the idea of the Lamb of God is very, very prominent in Johannine theology in, in John and in the book of Revelation. And it goes back to the Passover lamb. <clears throat> and remember that the lamb was slain. And then in, Reve in the Exodus 12, verse 13, God said, When I'm punishing, when I'm killing all the firstborn, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And that's whose blood? The blood of the lamb, see? So, uh, you know... Would you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood. It's power in the blood. Ah, the blood of the Lamb. All right. <clears throat> so think about the Lamb of God. Now this one here is one that we're going to spend a considerable amount of time on. The Jesus as our high priest. This is a major <clears throat> uh, theological contribution of the book of Hebrews. And we're all priests, but Jesus is our high priest. And the book of Hebrews really brings this out from a particular Old Testament 
passage, so we're going to spend some time here. Remember in the Old Testament, <coughs> excuse me, that the first high priest was who, Larry Davis? Uh, You're killing me, Larry Davis. Oh, in the Old Testament from Melchizedek? Yeah, in the Old Testament. I'm trying to think of that. Petrillo. Yes, sir. Who was the first high priest? Uh, what was the question that you asked before that? <laughs> that was the only one I remember. Who was the okay. first high priest? All right. Yes, Melchizedek then. Okay, Melchizedek was a priest after the after a different order, but the high priest under the law of Moses. Okay, Aaron. Aaron, okay. Did you know that, Larry Davis, already? I know it now. Yes, sir. Okay. Y'all had the Old, Te Old Testament classes? Yes, sir. No. No? You have yes. Okay. Yes. <clears throat> yeah, who was, who was uh, Aaron's sons, you remember, that got burned up in Leviticus 10? And Evan and Bayou. Yes. And who were his other two sons that became priests along with him? Elkanah? Eleazar and Ithamar. So you had Nadab, Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar. Those were his sons. And Aaron was the high priest. And he was supposed to wear special clothes. And he was the one that went in on the Day of Atonement. Nobody else but the high priest went in on the Day of Atonement, uh, etc. So you guys need to go back and do some serious boning up on all that, sounds like. But anyway, <clears throat> in uh, Hebrews, uh, we have the book of Hebrews, and this is where it's going to get a little bit, uh, if you're ready for it, you're going to learn some good stuff here. But there are three Old Testament passages around which most of the book of Hebrews is built. And the Hebrews chapters 3 and 4 is built around that first passage up there, Psalm 95, 7 through 11. And Hebrews 5 through 7 is built around that second passage right there, Psalm 110, verses 1 and 4. <clears throat> and Hebrews 8 through 10 is built around that third Old Testament passage right there, Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34. In fact, if you really understand the book of Hebrews... Those three Old Testament passages are the basis for the, for the theological argumentation in the body of the letter. What the writer of the book of Hebrews is actually doing is just commenting on those three Old Testament passages and trying to tell us uh, what's in those passages. And uh, the first one of those passages, excuse me, we're not going to go into the Psalm 95 one, we're going to center in on the, on the second one, Psalm 110. And it's, it's this passage, and this is where I want you to really concentrate here. <clears throat> Psalm 110, verse 1, is one of the, the key uh, Christological passages in the Old Testament, and it occurs many times, repeated many times in one way or another uh, in the New Testament. But uh, turn your Bibles to that, <clears throat> and at the same time, uh, turn your Bibles to Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 4, let me borrow a pen, Calvin, thank you sir, thank you sir, <coughs> alright Hebrews chapter 4, and we're going to look at uh, Psalm 110, but if you look at Hebrews chapter 4, starting with verse 14, out of the blue here, he says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess, for we do not have a high priest, he mentions it again, who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but we have one who is tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. Now watch verse 16. Let us then approach the throne of grace. Underline the throne of grace. Now we've been studying in this class the throne of God and the uh, cherubim, the living creatures that surround the throne of God. 
In the Old Testament, the throne of grace was called the mercy seat. The mercy seat. Seat meaning the place from which mercy is dispensed. <clears throat> and the mercy seat was actually on the top of what piece of furniture? The Ark of the Covenant. And uh, if you go back to uh, Exodus chapter 25 with me for just a minute. Exodus 25. And if you will go over here to... Uh, let's see here. <coughs> Verse 20... One, well, let's start with verse 20. Read out for me there. Uh, let's see here. Daryl, how about read 20 through 22 there? The cherubim shall have their wings spread upward, covering the mercy seat with their wings and facing one another. The faces of the cherubim are to be turned toward the mercy seat. You shall put the mercy seat on top of the ark, and in the ark you shall put the testimony which I will give to you. There I will meet with you, and from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim, which are upon the ark of the testimony. I All right. Speak with you. There I will meet with you, says he. <clears throat> See, there is, on the top of that box, between those two cherubim, there I will meet with you. That was a replica of the throne of God. It was called the mercy seat the seat of mercy, the seat of grace. That's what he's talking about in Hebrews 4 when he says, let us then approach the throne of grace. That's the mercy seat. We're going to come before the throne of God, the actual Ark of the Covenant, the actual throne of God in, the, in heaven. But our high priest, see, is the one that's going to help us approach the throne of grace. Because on the Day of Atonement, remember in Leviticus 16, only on the Day of Atonement, the high priest went inside the Holy of Holies where that Ark of the Covenant was, and he went to the throne of grace, to the mercy seat. And right there between those two cherubim on the top of that box, he sprinkled the blood of that sacrificial animal seven times on the mercy seat. See, that was where he obtained grace or mercy or forgiveness for the sins of the people of Israel. So Jesus is our high priest and he's going to enable us to approach the throne of grace and to receive mercy, not in some tabernacle, but the, but the actual temple of God in heaven, the actual throne of grace, not the replica, but the real one where his own blood is presented to God, see? <clears throat> so he begins talking to him about uh, being the high priest right there. But what we're going to see is he's coming out of Psalm 110, verse 1. Now let's go back to the psalm passage. And I'm going to have it on the screen. And I want to analyze this psalm passage before we go into the Hebrews passage in depth and see how it's brought out in the book of Hebrews. He starts out in Psalm 110, the Lord, and that's the YHVH tetragrammaton, the four-letter word, the name of God, Yahweh. Define Yahweh for me, Brother Anton Hutchinson. That's God's name. Amen. That's not the definition. It means to uh, that He is and that He exists. That's a cor absolutely correct, and it's the third person singular. The word to be. That's correct. So the definition of is He exists. He is, and it's the third person singular of the verb to be. All right, so the Lord Yahweh, that's the Hebrew word, Yahweh, says to my Lord, Edonai. See, these two words are completely different. Even though in English it's Lord and Lord, in Hebrew there's two separate words there. Yahweh says to my Edonai. That's what the Hebrew says, okay? So the first Lord there is Yahweh. That's the, that's the one that spoke in the burning bush, Yahweh. But then the second Lord is my Adonai. Now, who's writing Psalm 110? Who's the author of that psalm? David. David. So the word my, M-Y, refers to David. So Yahweh said to David's 
Master, David's Lord. <clears throat> Let's get this straight. Yahweh speaks to David's Lord. Okay? Now, Yahweh's talking to somebody else, but that somebody else that Yahweh's talking to is David's Lord. Okay? All right? <clears throat> Excuse me. So, when Yahweh speaks to David's Lord, Yahweh says, you, see, when he says you, he's talking to David's master, David's Lord, you sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. See the word you and your there, the you is understood, the your is explicit, refers to Adonai, David's Lord, that's you and your, okay? <clears throat> All right, then he keeps talking to him in verse 2, drop down to verse 2, the Lord, that's Yahweh again, see? The Lord, Yahweh, will stretch forth your strong scepter from Zion. Now see, if you go back up to verse 1, you sit at my right hand until I make your enemies. The you and the your refers to Edonai. You follow me or not? That's a weak yes. How many of you are lost and how many of you are with me? If you're lost, raise your hand. Okay. So, the Lord, Yahweh, in verse 2, will stretch forth your strong scepter. That's the same one he was talking to when he said, You sit my, at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool. Yahweh will stretch forth your strong scepter from Zion, saying, Rule in the midst of your enemies. And then in verse 3, your people will volunteer freely in the day of your power. See, this is the Edonai, verse 1. In holy array from the womb of the dawn, your youth are to you as the dew. See, he's still talking to the one he mentioned in verse 1. Then again in verse 4, Yahweh has sworn. <clears throat> See, here in, in verse um, in verse 4, where it says, the Lord here, that is Yahweh. Y-A-H-W-E-H. -E Boom. So you have Yahweh here three times. You've got him in uh, verse 1. And you've got him in verse 2. And then you've got him in verse 4. See? So what, let me ask you this to see if you're with me, Brother Gordy. What three individuals do we have being mentioned in this passage here? David, uh, Yahweh, and Adonai. You are exactly right. You're, you're a sharp dude. Did you, did you already know that, Jack, or not, that we had those three individuals in here? I think I knew that. Okay, I think you did. Who was the first one? <clears throat> Yahweh, that's the Lord, you know. Then we have Edonai, that's David's master. And then we've got David. Those are the three. Okay? So the, the you refers to, to David's Lord. All right. When we get back from uh, chapel, we'll keep analyzing this, and then we're going to dive into the book of Hebrews and show how uh, he analyzes this. Have a good chapel. We shall see you later. Sure.